Hey everyone, and welcome back to ID Anthro. Now once you start coming out and looking at bioretention systems in real life a fair bit, you'll start to notice that there's a whole bunch of variety of different you know, types or conditions of the surface of the bioretention system. So you'll find that depending on how old the system is, how well it's been looked after, how it was built, what materials were used, different things can start to happen to the surface of the system. And if you're going to maintain that system for the long term, you need to understand what's going on there, what the different varieties are, what's caused it, is it a problem, is it not, how do I adapt to it, that sort of thing. So today we're going to be looking at one particular uh, thing that can happen to the surface of bioretention systems. And this is a problem that's particularly common around the inlet of systems where there's a base flow of water coming into the system. And I'll show you what I mean. So here we have a bioretention system. Now this is part of a large bioretention system. So this system has three cells to it. We're looking at the first cell here. If I spin round back up in this direction, um, the catchments and all the houses and that sort of stuff is through the bush up there. It's really quite a large catchment. And then there's a sediment pond. Um, and then from the sediment pond, there are three culverts that split the water out into each of the three bioretention cells, the first of which we're looking at here. Now the thing about this being a really big bioretention system, and, it, and more importantly, on a big catchment, is that once you get catchments to a certain size, you can start to get constant base flows coming down them. Um, and that's because you get a big enough catchment, you start to get um, enough area with water seeping in, enough enough of a lag between where that water seeps in and when it actually comes out into the creek as interflow um, to start to get a constant base flow. And for a bioretention system, what that means is you start to get a constant trickle of water onto the filter media. Now this site had a constant trickle for a long period of time and that was for a slightly different reason, but it still demonstrates the point here. Now it's not trickling out right now, but you can see how moist it is um, in the inlet there with all, you know, all that gravel just there. Um, and the water just here. You can see that evidently not long ago it was flowing water here. And we've got this remnant ponding water on the surface in this little area here. And we've got some boggy patches just to the side there. And this is, this is the, you know, this is the problem that we see somewhat regularly. Um, certainly regularly when there's a constant base flow in bioretention. So the thing about bioretention systems is that we need the media to be freely draining to do the water treatment. However, they're not designed, and that media is not designed to be constantly wet. When it is constantly wet, it can blind up and block over and start to hold water permanently. Now, the blinding can happen through a couple of ways. Um, you can have it happen through algal growth. You can ha also have it happen through like deposition of really fine sediments. It doesn't really matter the mechanism, but in both cases, it's related to this constant base flow that we've, um, that's occurred in the past on this system and it's left its legacy that even though there isn't the constant base flow right now, there's still enough blockage at the front of this system uh, to prevent the water seeping in. So why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem for a few reasons. Why, one, it gives you a little bit of isolated water within which mosquitoes or that sort of thing could breed. Secondly, uh, this system isn't draining through all the media here, so at least theoretically the treatment's not quite as good. Thirdly, your bioretention system was probably planted out assuming that the plant species that were going to be in it would have a freely draining media. So you might have put something like, let's say a lamandra in the front. There weren't lamandras in this particular system, but it's a reasonable example. Lamandras grow along um, the riparian air edges of creeks, so along the edge and you know, up into the forest as well. And on that basis, they certainly like getting plenty of water, but they don't want to be in standing water in permanently boggy um, situations such as this, right? So that plant, whether it's lamandra or something else that was designed for freely draining situations, might then get, well, will then get really stressed when there's certainly permanently boggy soil and um, standing water like this and it'll probably die and then it opens up free space like we can see here for other um, weedy grasses to, to run in and do their thing. You get, you get species that can adapt. So in this instance here, um, 
the weedy grasses have run in where it's really just boggy conditions off to this side. We haven't had anything invade the actual open standing water just yet, but this would be a situation where you'd quite regularly um, expect to see typha or something like that pop up. So an aquatic plant that's not really meant to be there. And I bet you if eventually there's some typha back up in the uh, upper catchment up here, eventually at some point it's gonna make its way down this culvert and, uh, and find its way into the system and eventually you'll end up with typha in here. I've certainly seen heaps of bioretention systems that have been clogged up for whatever reason where typha ends up um, at least in, in the inlet and then depending on whether the rest of the system clogs up um, maybe further in. So a really relevant question here is what's going to happen? Will this get worse? Will it stop? What happens from here? And the honest answer is we don't 100% know. There is some concern that when you've got systems like this, that what might start to happen is that, you know, you have the constant base flow, it's constantly wetting up the first little bit of the media and it blinds that up. So then when the next bit of base flow comes in, it runs straight across that bit of media that's blinded up and onto the next bit and constantly wets that down and blinds it up and so on and so forth. And that this could creep out across the system. Now I haven't seen that happen um, just yet. I think it's probably more likely that there'll be a maximum extent based on uh, how much base flow is coming into the system, whether there still is any seepage going through and what the evaporation around it is like. I would find it unlikely that this would cause the entire, this entire system to blind up even given enough time. But it's something that we do need to keep an eye on in the future. I could be wrong about that. There's other, other people, you know, have that, uh, have a different view and think that it could threaten the whole cells. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on. So what could we do to fix this? Well, there's a few things to, I suppose, think about here. One of which is, why is there a base flow? What's going on, etc. Now in this particular case, the reason that there was what I've been referring to a base flow, as a base flow today, because that's how we most commonly see this happen. In this case, what actually happened was in the sediment pond upstream, there's these three culverts that connect through. Uh, obviously this is one of them here. And those culverts blocked up and that caused the water level to rise up in the sediment pond. And then there was enough head that it was just constantly forcing a little trickle of water down through this culvert here and out onto the surface. Now, what I notice here, and I really need to go and check this out again, but last time I was here, which was I think in May this year, um, and it's current, sorry, May last year, it's January. So we're talking like eight months ago, right? Um, I was out here uh, with a few other people. In fact, we were running a maintenance course and we grabbed the shovel and we unblocked those culverts. And I think this is the first time I've been back and I'm not seeing a base flow. So I need to go up and, and check that out. It's entirely possible that by unblocking those culverts, we've stopped the base flow. And what you're actually seeing here is now, well, now just the front of this media is blocked up. And last time it stormed, it ponded a bit of water at the front, but that's fine. This, in this case, it might not be getting any worse. But if you're in a system where the base flow is real, you might need to think about, are there ways to prevent it? Can we divert water around the front of the system? Um, what else can we do? In Townsville, the base flow that causes this is actually often from over irrigation of lawns. So in Townsville, there's historically been a culture of emerald green lawns and huge amounts of potable water gets used watering lawns in the dry season because Townsville's dry for like, absolutely bone dry for nine months of the year and yet the gutters run with a constant base flow. It's, it's quite ridiculous, really. Um, in Townsville's case, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons you don't want people using potable water um, in huge quantities to water their lawns. It's very inefficient. Um, but in Townsville's case, some community education about not overwatering and that sort of thing um, might also have flow on effects for bioretention systems. But let's say you can't stop the base flow. How might we adapt this system? Well, one option here would be to go, okay, clearly the front end of this just doesn't have the hydrologic re regime, um, you know, isn't, doesn't have the wetting and drying regime that we thought it did. It's not like a standard bioretention system that's dry the vast majority of the time and wet occasionally. The front end of this system is actually the other way around. So let's just adapt the plant species to it. If we think that there is always going to be standing water here, let's pick some species that like to be wet most of the time and dry just occasionally. They, like they can sustain it if there's a dry period for a while. 
So we'll get some more of these wetland plants, we'll plant out the front end in that sort of plant mix, we'll remove the weeds, and that will give us a buffer against this sort of weed invasion. Because the problem here, right, is the desirable vegetation died, the weeds have come in, and then those weeds have got a foothold that could allow them to go further into the system. And that's why we'd want to keep them out of the front end here. So we'll spin this back around. I hope you found that interesting. It's definitely, a, you know, this isn't such a problem for smaller bioretention systems, but it's something to keep, out, keep an eye out for on the big ones. Or if you're in a special case like, well, I should go back. It's not actually to do with bioretention size. It's to do with size of the catchment. If you have a big catchment and a bioretention system on it, regardless of whether that system is big or small, you are potentially going to have these constant base flows and then you are potentially going to have this risk. Equally, if you're a, a, you know, a, um, a fairly unique case like Townsville where you have a base flow for another reason, it can be a risk for that point of view. But there are certainly ways to adapt to try and you know, overcome this sort of thing and make the most of it. It's not the, uh, you know, it's not the death knell for your bioretention system by any means. Look at this, it's not extending that far out into the system. But it's something that we should try and avoid through sensible design. So for example, if you do have a really large catchment and you've got a choice between a bioretention system or a wetland, maybe a wetland's more sensible because a wetland can deal with the constant base flow if it's designed appropriately to it. Um, alternatively, if you've already got a bioretention system in the ground with this, well, you know, don't stress too much. There's things that we can do to adapt to it and make the system more resilient. It's all about adaptive management. It's all about looking at, well, you know, what is the regime we have? And then looking out to nature and going, what plants are available that might fit into that regime and adapting to it. Okay, cool. That's it for now. Thanks for tuning into this episode of ID Anthro. If you want to know more about what we can do, you can find us online at idanthro.com. We have a mailing list, which we use to uh, send out every time we release a video. You can, if you want to subscribe to that, you can go to idanthro.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and there's a sign up there for the mailing list. Equally, you can keep in touch with us on Facebook. The Facebook page is facebook.com slash idanthro. We post all our videos and stuff there. And you can find us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, that sort of thing. Now, if you're liking what we're doing, but you've got a question about something we haven't, well, something we have covered for that matter, or you'd like to know about something that we haven't covered, drop us a line, let us know. We'll do our best to address it in a video. If we don't have the expertise, we'll try and go and find someone, bring them on, interview them, chat to them, and try and answer your question. Cool, that's it for now. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.